Welcome, everybody. I know you're very anxious to, for me to give the floor to our speakers today, so I will be very brief just to explain a few things uh, about STOA, who organized this event. Um, um, so STOA is basically the Science and Technology Options Assessment of the European Parliament. This is the unit that identifies all the new technologies and all the challenges that we might face for the future and uh, make some research and workshops and studies to give the options and the data to the members of the European Parliament. I think we have a much broader audience, of course, but uh, this is the main cause so that they can make um, the decisions that will be best for legislation and that we don't stop innovation, but we will also have in our heads the implications and the potential, of course, of its technology. Um, sometimes this is, not, uh, <laughs> this is not common sense. We have to prepare the members for these new technologies, for example, for AI today, because it's, uh, it's unknown. Sometimes it sounds a bit scary. And uh, we have to explain it. We have to see the potential. We have to see if we should control something or if we should completely allow it and if we should have a code of ethics, perhaps, on how we fund this new technology. So... Should we fear the future? Uh, well, in fact, uh, when we talk about this, we mean all the technological developments that have already taken part in our lives. Either we identify them as new technologies or they are already part of our daily lives. Um, I think we can all uh, remember that we have heard or seen data that said that it's possible to automate 47% of all jobs in the U.S., that was the research, in the next 10 to 20 years, with great consequences for our labor force, or to take it a bit further, uh, there are many ethical questions arising already on how we would treat AI machines with levels of intelligence. We are scared that there might be 40 or 45 percent of job losses due to the AI. Of course, at the same time, there is a prediction that our kids, 65 percent, will have jobs that are unknown to us for the time being. So we don't even know what kind of jobs will be created in the near future. And of course, we also have super intelligence. We can be absolutely sure that the goals of it will be compatible with uh, human beings because human beings are creating the artificial intelligence. But in our, one of our recent events, uh, somebody who was working a lot with algorithms and deep learning told us that some decisions of the algorithms he didn't even understand because of the amount of data that these algorithms take and they change and they transform themselves, the results sometimes were even scary for the scientists. So um, I think we have many experts together uh, today and uh, we hope that this discussion will shed some uh, light to the very complex topic of uh, the development of AI and to contribute to make uh, all of us live uh, with less fear of the future and also maybe in our head to have a reply to, to Musk and Gates, that uh, even Zuckerberg, that they have now a debate on how much we should control AI. And I think it's very important to have this answer here from the European Parliament. And before I pass the floor to the next uh, speakers, I would also like to add that uh, STOA, our, um, our unit is trying to transform to a permanent committee for the future because we actually believe that the use of data and the implications, because artificial intelligence is also based in data and algorithms and mathematics, um, I think we need a strong committee for the future. It's good that I was delaying a bit because we have more people coming. Um, so we will make this effort. It's already happening in other uh, member states. For example, in Finland, they actually have a committee for the future and they have a strategy for the future. I think it would be really important to manage to do that. And before passing the floor, I would like also to thank my colleague uh, of the European Parliament, Teresa Jimenez Barbat, who had the brilliant idea for this event, as well as the Store Secretariat, of course, and Mr. Philip Boucher to set up this event. And also, Teresa, may I say, she also was in charge of the poster that we have, <laughs> and I think is uh, the best poster that we ever had in, in STOA. <laughs> <laughs> we will continue like that, and uh, thank you very much for organizing everything. So um, just uh, um, one more point that I forgot. This event is web-streamed. 
And when uh, I posted this poster, everybody from Greece were asking, how can we participate? And they were really jealous of having uh, you with us today and all our speakers. And I told them it's web streamed. So today we have audience also in Greece, at least. <laughs> so thank you very much. I give you the floor to present our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva, for, for certain for having been so uh, kind and for offering hospitality to this STOA um, activity. We have a lot of guests here from Spain. We're inaugurating uh, this r event right now at the time when in Catalonia the regional government will be declaring independence. It's a very uh, sad moment where we derogate from uh, Catalan laws and constitution, even uh, European uh, laws, and uh, it denies the will of ha over half the population of Catalonia. This will probably lead to the suspension of the autonomy of my homeland and the homeland of many of the people who are here. So this is a dangerous time, and obviously nobody likes to have the autonomy of their home uh, land uh, suspended. Now, those who are interested in f mass phenomena, they uh, will probably uh, realize that we are going to be studying effects of these kinds of effects in the future. How can a free and happy people uh, end up in difficulties like uh, the one that Catalonia is facing at the moment. So moving on, welcome to the seventh meeting of Euromind. Euromind is a platform that we organize in my office in the European Parliament and which organizes thematic events and thematic publications on the confluence of science and social sciences to and put them at the service of politicians. Everyone knows that science is very important if we're looking at energy or the chemistry industry or biotechnology. And we also, we need to have the information available to us from science, uh, from neuroscience, from biotechnology, so that politicians have the information they need to understand phenomena like uh, 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 gender issues, uh, nationalism, and, and many others. We have had the creme de la creme uh, presenting here. We've had Richard Dawkins here. We had him here last year, Michael Sherman, who was uh, at an event we organized in Barcelona, or the sister of today's speaker. Susan was here a few months ago. And since I'm talking about Susan, I'll take advantage of that to um, uh, uh, talk now about Stephen Pinker. He is an experimental sci psychologist, psycholinguist, studies social relations, was born in Canada. He gives classes in Harvard. He's studied, he's published in Time, Prospect and Foreign Policy, uh, uh, or, or rather um, uh, uh, he's been named there as one of the most influential scientists in the world. And he's published many, many uh, specialist articles and books. And uh, he publishes on evolutionary science. Uh, he... Uh, published uh, a very important work in 2002 in Spain, which was very important in uh, uh, Spanish intellectual circles. He focuses on human nature, which is universal, and he focuses on the language instinct, but he has an optimistic vision of human uh, development. Uh, and uh, when we talk about uh, the decline towards violence, he says 
that he thinks that a belief in progress uh, he that's compatible with the virtue of uh, human nature his last book the sense of style talks about how to write well about science and we're now awaiting his next book i've already ordered this on amazon it's called enlightenment now and it studies uh, enlightenment thinking how important for this house for example and like all good things well we'll have to wait for it and we'll have to wait until uh, the start of next year so Stephen I'll hand the floor to you please go ahead Thank you. I'm going to give you a preview of my forthcoming book Enlightenment Now uh, the last word of the subtitle is progress it is a major theme of the book uh, and I wrote it in part because I discovered that intellectuals hate progress and intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. If you think that we can solve problems, then you have a blind faith or a quasi-religious belief in the outmoded superstition of the false promise of the myth of the onward march of inevitable progress. You are a cheerleader for vulgar American can-do-ism with the rah-rah spirit of boardroom ideology, Silicon Valley, and the Chamber of Commerce. You are a practitioner of Whig history, a naive optimist, a Pollyanna, and of course, a Pangloss named after the Voltaire character who declared, we are all is for the best in the best of all possible wor worlds. Well, my reply is that progress need not uh, be associated with any of these temperaments or philosophies, that rather progress is an empirical hypothesis. Uh, namely, their uh, human well-being can be measured. Uh, life, health, sustenance, wealth, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge, leisure, and happiness. If they have increased over time, that is progress. Well, let's look at some of the data. We can begin with the most basic dimension of hu human well-being of all, life and health. And uh, we see a pattern that is... Uh, you will see over and over again whenever you map out some dimension of human well-being. Namely, before the Enlightenment, in, say, the early 18th century, basically the entire world was uh, miserable and abject. Uh, then uh, Europe and the Americas, the, and uh, the United States, North America, started to pull away from this state of universal uh, misery. Here we see that the uh, average lifespan in uh, England, in Europe, in the uh, 18th century was about 30. That's pretty much where it had, it had been parked for thousands of years before. But then starting in the 19th century, the lifespan of Europeans dramatically in increased. That was quickly followed by the Americas, then Asia, uh, the, and uh, more recently Africa. Here you have the plot for the entire world. The average life expectancy today is uh, 71 across the entire world, averaging over rich and poor countries and including all of the premature deaths from uh, zero-year-old uh, infants. Virtually no one guesses that the world's average lifespan is that high. Uh, child mortality follows a similar pattern. In Sweden, one of the world's most uh, advanced countries in the 18th century, one-third of all children died before their... Uh, fifth birthday, and that declined to very close to zero over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries. That was then followed by uh, countries in the Americas, such as Canada, then uh, Asia, South Korea, uh, even in the 20th century had a rate of child mortality similar to Sweden's in the 18th century, but it has come down. Uh, Chile, and uh, uh, African countries are following su suit. Here you have the graph for Ethiopia, which represents sub-Saharan Africa. Likewise, maternal mortality. Uh, a couple of centuries ago, a woman had a 1% chance of dying in childbirth. Childbirth in the 18th century was as lethal as breast cancer is today. Uh, 
Uh, Sweden brought the rate down, followed by the United States, uh, Asian countries such as Malaysia, and uh, now we're seeing Africa catch up as well. That's the graph for Ethiopia. Sustenance. Famine used to be a uh, regular occurrence in all parts of the world. Uh, but starting with the agricultural revolution in the 18th century, the number of calories available to a person started to shoot up, first in England, uh, United States, and uh, France. But then more recently, China has caught up. Uh, even India, long associated with famine, now uh, exports grain. And here we have the graph for the world as a whole. The uh, average for the world is uh, the number of calories needed for an active middle-aged man. Uh, we, uh, the increase in calories is not just going to make uh, rich people fatter, but it is uh, also preventing the stunting of children. Um, the United States for a long time has not had uh, malnourished children, but uh, as recently as the 1960s, 40% of children in South America were stunted. That has been brought down to less than 10%. Uh, likewise, we see a decline of stunting in um, China, in, uh, followed by Kenya, uh, sub-Saharan African country, and uh, Bangladesh. Uh, as a result, famine deaths have been uh, decimated, and uh, whereas famine used to be a threat everywhere on Earth, now there are just a few uh, pockets in Africa that are vulnerable to famine. Uh, prosperity. Here you have a graph of uh, prosperity in the world from the year 1 to the year 2000. For thousands of years, everyone was poor. Then, starting with the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, there was a 200-fold increase in the uh, gross world product. Once again, that did not uh, unfold evenly across the world's regions. Uh, the UK was the first, uh, overtaken by the United States. But then, more recently, South Korea has almost caught up. Uh, Chile, uh, China, and you see uh, India accelerating it as well. This pattern is sometimes called the uh, Great Convergence. Um, uh, a as a result, extreme poverty, which is the inability to feed oneself and one's family, has been decimated. In the 19th century, 90% of the world met the criterion for extreme poverty. That has now been reduced to 10%. And the United Nations has set the goal of eliminating extreme poverty from the face of the earth by the year 2030, which means that most of us uh, might, li might live to see that the day in which po extreme poverty will vanish from the face of the earth. As a result, for all the talk of increased inequality within uh, wealthy Western countries, globally inequality is decreasing because poor countries are getting richer faster than rich countries are getting richer. Uh, here you have two estimates of an international Gini index showing this uh, recent decline. As countries become richer, <clears throat> they devote more of their wealth to helping the worse off, the children, the poor, the sick, the aged. Uh, every affluent country uh, devotes at least 20% of its GDP now to uh, social spending for centuries, that, was, that figure was 1%. So here you, you have the data for France, Italy, Sweden, Germany, uh, Greece, Netherlands, UK, uh, and so on. It's a pattern that no uh, affluent country uh, escapes. Thanks to the social spending, uh, poverty is, has, is being decimated within Western countries. Again, for all the talk about the uh, problems with the American economy, the growth in, the growth in inequality, what really counts, namely poverty, has been in a decline. Here you have the American poverty rate. If you take into account social spending, such as the earned income tax credit, social security, and so on, and the decline is even more dramatic if you look at consumption, uh, which is really what counts when you consider poverty, namely can people afford to feed themselves, clothe them themselves, house themselves, and so on. By one estimate, the poverty rate in the United States was 30% in 1960, it has now fallen to 3% when measured by consumption. Peace. It used to be the uh, case that war was the natural state of affairs and peace was me merely an interlude between wars. This graph shows the 
percentage of time that the great powers of the day, that is the most powerful states and empires, fought wars against uh, each other from 1500 to the present. And you can see that uh, several hundred years ago, the great powers were pretty much always at war. Now they are never at war. The last great power war took place more than uh, 60 years ago, the uh, Korean War, which pitted China against uh, the United uh, States. Uh, even the wars that have taken place, mostly civil wars, kill a fraction of the people that they used to. Here we have the uh, rate of death in wars from 1946 to the present. And it's been a bumpy ride. There are spikes for the Korean War, for the Vietnam War, for the Iran-Iraq War. But we now see that the rate of death in war, which is about one per 100,000 per year, has fallen considerably from the 1950s when it was 22 per 100,000 per year. Freedom and rights have been uh, uh, in the ascent, despite some discouraging headlines. Notwithstanding the common claim that democracy is in retreat, that there's a democratic meltdown or rollback, uh, the world has never been more democratic. This is a score of the uh, average uh, uh, measure of democracy versus autocracy across the world's nations, and it shows that uh, we are living in a time in which a majority of nations are more democratic than not, and a majority of people in the world live in democratic nations for the first time in history. Human rights are harder to uh, quantify, but there has been one data scientist who's tried uh, to quantify human rights such as violations such as summary executions, imprisoning dissidents, and so on. The gold standard for human rights uh, is the, uh, to be found in Scandinavian countries. And here we see that Norway started out in 1946 as having a high level of human rights, and it's gone uh, even higher. The uh, Koreas have gone in opposite directions. In the 1940s, there was very little difference between South Korea and North Korea. They were both dictatorships. Uh, South Korea has gotten as, as respected human rights increasingly. North Korea, as uh, should be obvious, has gone downhill. A country like uh, China, the opposite of a gold standard, is still um, has a higher level of human rights today than it certainly did during the Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward of Mao Zedong. The world as a whole, uh, with all of the backsliding, all of the, the Turkeys and Russias uh, and uh, Venezuelas, still shows an upward arc in progress toward human rights. Uh, one manifestation of respect for human life is in the death penalty, where country after country has abolished the death penalty. Here you see a timeline from 1863 to the present. Over the last couple of decades, every year, three, uh, three countries abolish the death penalty. If the current trend continues, not to say that it will, uh, the death penalty will vanish from the face of the earth by 2026. Homosexuality is being uh, abolished in country after country. Again, notwithstanding backsliding in countries like uh, Uganda and Russia, but still the overall trend is for homosexuality to be decriminalized. Uh, and child labor has been, uh, is, is being decimated. Uh, in uh, 1850, about 30 percent of English children uh, were in the workforce. Uh, that has gone to pretty much zero. Here you have the curve uh, for England and the United States for Italy, and for the uh, world as a whole, uh, there is still far too much child labor, but the trajectory is definitely downward. Safety. We have never been safer. Uh, here you have a graph of homicide deaths over the last uh, 50 years, showing that the United States has reduced its rate of homicide by uh, more than 50 percent. Uh, England, too, has seen a 50 percent reduction since the, uh, in the 21st century alone. And the world as a whole has, now has a, a homicide rates of 70% uh, of what it was just at the turn of the millennium. Uh, in the United States, uh, violence against wives and girlfriends, domestic violence has been uh, decreasing, as has uh, sexual assault and rape. Violence against children has been in decline. Uh, this, these figures are for the United States. The uh, rate of children being uh, beaten up or bullied at school has declined. The rate of physical abuse by caregivers and the rate of sexual abuse have come down. The, our technology 
has become safer and safer. As far as I know, this is a, uh, a universal law, and uh, the reductions have been dramatic. Uh, an American today has uh, about 1 percent of the chance of being killed in a car accident as his counterpart of a century before. Uh, pedestrians are uh, 20 times less likely to be mowed down on the sidewalk. People are about uh, a million times less likely to die in a plane crash. People are less likely to fall to their deaths, less likely to drown, less likely to be burned to death in a fire, less likely to be uh, asphyxiated by, by uh, gas. One exception, the uh, rate of poisoning by solids or liquids has gone up, and what you're seeing here is the American uh, opioid epidemic. So it, it obviously is not the case that everything improves all the time. That would be uh, magic, not progress. Uh, Americans are far less likely to be killed on the job. Uh, again, a reduction of about 95 percent. And people the world over are less likely to die in earthquakes, floods, uh, wildfires, mudslides, and meteor strikes. Here you have the rate of, of uh, death from natural disasters. Uh, my favorite in, in these is uh, if you think of the quintessential uh, act of God, the bolt from the blue, uh, that is being struck, to, being killed by a bolt of lightning. Uh, Americans now have 3% of the chance of being killed by a bolt of lightning as uh, Americans of a century ago. Uh, knowledge has been on the increase. Uh, it used to be that uh, only about 15% of the world knew how to read and write in the um, early modern period. That uh, First we see the Netherlands achieving universal literacy, then uh, England, Germany, uh, Italy a bit later, uh, United States. And as with all the other measures of well-being, the rest of the world is catching up. Here you have the figure, the curve for China, for uh, Mexico, and for the world as a whole. More than 80 percent of the world is literate now, and the illiterate people are all in their 70s and 80s. When they die, die off, the world will achieve close to 100 percent literacy. Likewise, basic education, the um, uh, elementary school, here we have uh, the British offshoots, Western Europe, Eastern Europe a little later, East Asia, uh, Latin America, uh, the uh, Middle East, and uh, South and East Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, once again, there is a lag, but that we are starting to see a convergence. There you have the figure for the world as a whole. Believe it or not, we are getting smarter. In a phenomenon called the Flynn effect, IQ scores have been increasing by three points a decade for a century, with the result that humans today are about 30 IQ points higher than their ancestors uh, a century ago. Here you have the figures for each of the continents. Uh, what are we doing with all of this wealth and health? Well, we are enjoying life as opposed to um, slaving away at jobs. Work hours in uh, Western Europe and the United States have been declining since the 19th century by about 22 hours a week. Uh, people spend less of their paycheck on food, clothing, and shelter. It used to be more than 60 percent of your paycheck went to the necessities of life. Now it's uh, about one-third. Thanks to the growth of appliances and utilities like running water, electricity, washing machines, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, uh, dishwashers, uh, stoves, uh, microwaves, uh, the amount of time that we lose to housework um, has been uh, steadily decreasing uh, from more than 60 hours a week to less than 20. As a result of all of these, leisure time has uh, increased by about 12 hours a week, more so for men than for women, and that's because uh, women have are uh, using their, their uh, extra time to spend more time with their children, which uh, doesn't count as leisure time. Uh, is it making us any happier? Well, probably yes. Um, here's a graph that shows the relationship between self-assessed life satisfaction and uh, gross domestic product over, over countries. The richer the country, the happier the uh, person, on average. Uh, this Gra this uh, data cloud shows a number of arrows indicating the relationship between happiness and income within each country. And as you can see, 
Richer countries are happier. Richer people within countries are uh, happier, which means that as the world gets richer, on average, it gets happier. Well, how is the fact of human progress? All of these developments that I, I have shown you reflected in the news. Well, I'm going to show you a graph that is the result of uh, a, a tone mapping algorithm where thousands of news stories from the New York Times since the 1940s are rated in terms of their ratio of positive words uh, like uh, better, improve, increase, good, to negative words like crisis, deterioration, uh, horrible, and so on. And as you can see, since the 1940s, the New York Times has been getting uh, more and more negative. It's not just the New York Times. This is a composite of uh, broadcasts from media all over the world. So as the world has been getting better and better, the media have been getting more and more negative journalism. So why do intellectuals and journalists deny uh, progress? It is just an overwhelming fact about the human condition, and the picture of the world given to us by the writers and thinkers is the opposite to reality. Well, one possibility is uh, a psychological phenomenon discovered by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky called the availability heuristic. Namely, the human brain estimates probability according to how easily examples from memory pop into mind. So if you uh, see news about a terrorist attack, you assume that terrorism is common. If you read about a shark attack, you don't go into the water. Uh, if you see a uh, tornado, you think that tornadoes are a major cause of death and so on. If you combine that with uh, the famous watchword of uh, news programming, namely, if it bleeds, it leads, uh, violent stories get the most attention, the most clicks, the most eyeballs, then you get the illusion that the world is more dangerous than it ever has been. I think that's not the only reason. There's a second psychological phenomenon behind it, uh, the negativity bias, sometimes summarized by the slogan, bad is stronger than good. This summarized this is the results of hundreds of experiments showing that people think and feel uh, about bad events much more than uh, good events, probably because there are so many more ways for things to go wrong than to go right now and in our evolu evolutionary history. And the cost of missing a danger is much greater than the uh, cost of failing to note a uh, beneficial development. Uh, a third phenomenon is what I, I think of as the gravitas market. Namely, if you want to be taken seriously as a social critic, as a prophet, then it's much, uh, uh, much more clever to be pessimistic than optimistic. Pessimism sounds serious. Optimism sounds frivolous. As one business writer put it, Pessimists sound like they're trying to help you. Optimists sound like they're trying to sell you something. Uh, finally, a somewhat cynical explanation is that there's uh, a status competition among elites. All of us uh, seek to enhance the prestige of our tribe, our profession. And when uh, intellectuals aren't responsible for running things, they just comment. When intellectuals disparage the state of the world, it's another way of undermining the prestige of politicians, civil servants, business people, the military, and so on. Well, is it uh, good to be pessimistic? Is it, is it socially responsible? Is it good to speak truth to power, to uh, hold the powerful uh, accountable, to uh, afflict the comfortable? Well, it has a, a serious downside that I think we are only beginning to recognize, uh, namely that uh, fatalism, if uh, all of the pictures of the state of the world are that it's going to hell in a handcart, it's a flaming d uh, dumpster, it's a disaster, everything, everything is a crisis. Well, people are going to say, well, there's just, why waste time and money on uh, a hopeless cause? Uh, I may as well just enjoy life, uh, bring home my paycheck, uh, bring up my uh, children, and enjoy life while it lasts. Um, and cynicism. Uh, it, in, for people who do want to change things, if they are told that every institution is failing, it's bound to encourage the uh, philosophy of to smash the machine, to drain the swamp, to burn the empire to the ground. And it uh, lays open an um, invitation for strong, charismatic leaders to say, uh, only I can fix it. Now, is progress inevitable? 
I've shown a number of curves that just keep to go, going up and up, and the answer is, of course not. Uh, there is no dialectic that carries us ever upward. There is no mystical arc of justice. Uh, and indeed, any solution will create new problems which have to be solved in turn, and history can always throw nasty surprises at us. And there have been a number of them, the two world wars, the increase in crime in the, from the 1960s to the 1980s in every Western country, the AIDS epidemic in Africa, which reversed the increase in longevity, and as we are seeing today, the rise of authoritarianism in Russia, Turkey, Eastern Europe, and elsewhere. There are major threats, uh, undoubtedly, including uh, prominent among them are nuclear war and climate change, although I do have to mention that these should not be seen as uh, portents of inevitable doom either, that there are uh, signs that, that uh, these threats can uh, begin to be mitigated. Here we have the number of nuclear weapons in the world from 1945 to 2015. Very few people are aware of the fact that the nucle world's nuclear arsenal has been reduced by 85%. And about 10% of the electricity in the United States comes from uh, decommissioned nuclear weapons, the ultimate swords into plowshares. Uh, it, we cannot expect this curve to be extrapolated to zero uh, anytime soon. But uh, it is not an idle dream, and as you probably know, some of the, the world's most uh, vociferous Cold War hawks, like Ronald Reagan, like Henry Kissinger, like George Shultz, have called uh, for a world without nuclear weapons. Likewise, uh, the world's greatest challenge is undoubtedly climate change, but I think we uh, ought not to see it as an unsolvable problem, as inevitable doom. Uh, this graph showing the trajectory of CO2 emissions suggests that the world has uh, reached peak coal and might even have reached peak carbon. Here you have the European Union, CO2 emissions, the United States, uh, China, uh, India, uh, and other regions of the world. All in all, the, at least the rate of increase has come down. That is obviously not enough to uh, address global warming, but it shows that industrial society is not on an inevitable path of indefinitely increasing CO2 emissions. Uh, I'm going to just throw this out, and I'm not going to defend it because it will segue into the next session. Uh, you can't worry about everything. We really should worry about nuclear war. We should really worry about climate change. I think worrying about um, runaway artificial intelligence of robots taking over, enslaving us, uh, for reasons that I can expand later, uh, I think is not an existential threat. Uh, whoops, I, so I'm just to stay on time, I'm going to skip that. Um, <laughs> but I, I can go through it later if there is time, but I'm going to cede the floor to my, uh, my fellow panelists. So progress is not a law of nature. Uh, I argue in the book that it is a gift of pursuing the ideals of the Enlightenment, namely reason, science, and humanism. These ideals must be identified and defended. They are what we have to thank for the progress that we have enjoyed. If we continue to pursue them, we can enjoy more progress. If we don't, we won't. Uh, and overall, what it shows is that human effort is not futile. Despite the headlines, humanity has made tremendous progress and there is reasonable hope for much more. Thank you very much. I'm optimistic already, more, so thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Well, thank you very much indeed. We, we need this type of, of energy here in the Parliament. So thank you very much indeed. Now we'd like to begin with the second uh, speaker. We, we know there will be questions, but uh, we're going to hold off into the end for the, the, that part. Now we're going to move into uh, a section which will be moderated by uh, Mr. Pinker on artificial intelligence. I'd like to move on without further ado to present the speakers. We have uh, Peter uh, J. Bentley. He's an investigator in the area of uh, in, uh, computer sciences at the University College of London. He's an expert in artificial intelligence. He's worked in uh, evaluative uh, 
intelligence, artificial intelligence, uh, and the artificial immune systems. He's uh, been involved in, he writes for Wired and New Scientist, other activities. He's developed uh, the mobile media uh, app, the Stethoscope. The Stethoscope Pro. Now I'd like to uh, present them in one go, and then we'll go through uh, them in perhaps a different order, which uh, we've got Thomas Mischinger as well. He's a German a philosopher, a specialist in artificial intelligence. He's well known for his model of, uh, of uh, humanist uh, consciousness. He's uh, a theoretical professor in Germany. Among other things, he's got a, a book called The Ego Tunnel. Then we have uh, uh, the, uh, Ali Hagestam from Chalmers University of Technology. He's uh, as well known for his bestseller, Here Be Dragons. I, I read it, says the speaker, which looks at the future of technology. Then we have Mile Brundage. He's uh, an inspector or a researcher at the University of Oxford's uh, Future for Humanity Institute. He's been looking at the social ramifications of emerging technologies, particularly artificial intelligence and robotics. So I don't know who would like to go first. This panel will be moderated, in fact, by Mr. Steven Pinker. Who would like to take the first uh, stab at this? Cool. <laughs> Good I, I suggest we go in the order in which uh, speakers oh, okay. are listed in the program. That seems the, the, uh, as good an order as any. Uh, so th that would uh, s hand the floor over to uh, Peter Bentley from the University College. Well, thanks very much, Stephen. Um, uh, before I start, um, do we want to do any questions for Stephen? Well, actually, we plan to have the, the questions at the end. We, we thought we'd do the questions at the very end, let everyone speak first. I'm a computer scientist. I follow, you know, instructions on paper quite closely. <laughs> So I am um, the only computer scientist on this panel, and this is a debate about artificial intelligence. So I would claim to have some, uh, let's say, credibility, I hope, in what I say. Um, I've had a research group in exactly this area for 20 years at University College London. These days I also have a company which specializes in AI, and we provide solutions for large multinational organizations. So um, let's say I, I've spent some time thinking about this area. My research group at UCL is now based in my company, and we continue to innovate and create some of the new AI algorithms that apparently are very scary to some people. Um, I'm going to, I, I didn't realize, I have to say, that Stephen had so many graphs. And <laughs> had I known, I might not have chosen graphs for my talk. Um, <laughs> but mine are simpler, and I've got far fewer of them. You'll be pleased to know. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is um, people's perception about these technologies um, and whether these perceptions are let's say, um, accurate or not, to continue the theme from Stephen's talk. Um, so frequently, I hear as a computer scientist statements such as, well, look, look at the curves, look at the curves. If you, if you think of this as the, the rate of progress in processor, in computer processors, well, it looks like that. It's amazing. Or if you think of it as uh, the rate of progress in our ability to process data, or in the, indeed even in the amount of data that we now produce, it looks like this. And there are some people that, well, perhaps quite naturally, they imagine you can follow this curve upwards. And look, it's, it's already almost vertical. This is, this is an exponential. If you... If time is on the x-axis, well, it, it can't be more than just a few days before we're going to have 
unbelievable processing power. I mean, processing power is clearly going to go head towards infinity, isn't it? And if, if that has some implications on artificial intelligence, well, clearly it's only a matter of weeks before we've got super intelligences. And if we've got super intelligence as well, of course, the first thing they're going to think of is, aren't people a waste of space? Let's kill them all. Now, yeah, it, it's, it's good plot lines for movies. I enjoy those movies. Um, I, and I'm a real science fiction fan. Um, but we have to be realistic here. Um, this is only a bit of the curve. Uh, I, you know, these days I have to meet a lot of investors, and investors love to show these curves. Well, oh, you've got a hockey stick curve in, in your finances. It's going to be amazing. Well, let's look a little bit more at the same curve. This is actually the curve that's pervasive in business, in the natural world, and in progress in individual solutions that we create. So actually you find this throughout nature. This is a classic population curve. But you also find it with pretty much every new idea. And I'll, I'll try and keep it on AI since this is a debate about AI. So every time we create a new algorithm, well it takes us a while, so there's a lag phase. It takes us a while to get this new AI method working but once we've got the hang of it, it looks really good. We get a, an amazing ability. These things get taken up quite rapidly. And then we hit a point where we realize, okay, this is about what this algorithm can do. It has a finite capability. Can't do everything. It's not gonna suddenly become super intelligent. Each algorithm is good at a particular thing. It might be good at learning. It might be good at classifying data. It might be good at optimizing certain kinds of things. And indeed, we've got theories, and I'm not going to go into those theories because you're probably not going to be that interested, but there are mathematical proofs that say that you need a different kind of algorithm for each new problem. There's no one-size-fits-all. So this has really big implications about artificial intelligence. This means that... Number one, we have to work really hard, and we do work really hard. I'm, I'm one of the scientists, and we spend our entire careers developing AI solutions, and each time we've got a new difficult problem, we go through this kind of process. It takes us ages to figure out how to do it. If we're lucky, if we're lucky, we think of something that works pretty well, and then when we apply it, it works all right. It works to a certain level. And then we hit that ceiling. We hit its capability. And we find, okay, that's about all it can do then. And as much as we push it, as much as we try and make it go further, it doesn't want to go any further. That's as good as it can go. So then we have to create another solution, another algorithm. And this is really, I, I've spent my career working with biologists, studying what biological intelligence is like. And this is really our understanding of what intelligence may be like in general. There's no one size fits all. There's no universal architecture. There's different neural circuits. There's different clever bits of our brain that tackle different problems. And every time through our evolutionary history that a new problem has come about, we've had to add new bits of brain to solve that problem. So there are there's a breaking factor here. This is, this is not to say this is a, a, a bad thing, because we can be optimistic. I, I want to be optimistic in this talk. The optimistic part is all this stuff about superintelligence and AI is getting out of our control. Seriously, guys, forget it. I'm, I'm one of the computer scientists who spend all of our time just trying to make the damn things work. I mean, seriously, this curve kills us because every time we think we've got something good and we try and solve the problem, we hit the ceiling. We hit the ceiling of what it can do. And we thought, damn it, we thought we got it this time. No, it's not good enough. We have to, we have to tune it. We have to find a different idea. 
there are actually other breaking factors too. So I've only talked about the, the capability limits of each different method. Actually, there are real constraints. There are physical constraints. There are energy constraints. There are spatial constraints. All of these slow down our ability to solve problems. There's also, I have to say, limits in us. We don't understand what intelligence is, really. We don't know really how the brain works. And as much as we have models, so deep learning, neural network-based models, these are based on very, very, very abstract, simplified understandings of how the brain works. I, I've got a neuroscientist working in my lab. And seriously, when, when we ask her to do some wet lab experiments to try and get a little bit more data about how a neuron works, I, I mean, the data is almost non-existent for the simplest things about what, what real neurons do, how they connect themselves together, what topologies of network are required to solve different problems. So our problem is a considerable one in terms of making intelligence. It's not going to make itself. Believe me, it's not going to make itself. My background is actually originally in genetic algorithms, and the whole point of that is to make computers evolve solutions automatically, get them to adapt and change things. My goodness, that's difficult. You wouldn't believe how clever natural solutions are, how intricate the solutions in our own DNA is to allow us to keep evolving. We don't know how to do that either. We don't know how to evolve ever more complex <coughs> networks. We don't know how to do all these things. And it's not for lack of trying. We've got tens of thousands of computer scientists now. You know, it's fashionable today, right? So Google, Facebook, um, every major Apple, all the major companies plus hundreds and hundreds of smaller companies are getting the best, the cleverest mathematicians and computer scientists all to try and solve these problems. We've also got major research efforts trying to understand the brain. Um, yeah, guys, it's, it's difficult. It's really difficult. So, and yet there's even more problems that that slow this, that, that acts as a breaking point. And that is, okay, so most of us don't create. Most of us, when we're trying to solve problems, we don't try and create a general intelligence. And we, we don't do it for a very good reason, because we don't know how to. What we tend to do is we have a specific problem, and we try and create an algorithm that solves that specific problem. If we do try and do a general intelligence, where we run into the kinds of difficulties that I think nature points to. I mean, for me, there's a real reason why um, advanced, complex brains are quite rare in nature. You, to solve most problems, you don't need a big brain. You don't see a lot of trees with big brains. So you don't need them. And actually, to solve a lot of problems, you don't need big, complicated brains. It takes a huge amount of effort in terms of evolutionary effort to create a big brain, a general intelligence, because every time you add a little bit of a new capability, you've almost exponentially increased all the different things that brain could do. And that you have to think of in terms of testing. Just think how many things that it can now get wrong how many ways it can kill itself, how many new stupid things it could do. So every time you add a little bit of extra intelligence, you've got a vast amount of extra testing to do. And this requires a huge amount of effort. Now, nature can do that because it's had millions of years. It's got unthinkable numbers of species, of different entities, of different problems, a lot of time. It's an amazing parallel supercomputer, <coughs> the Earth and life. But actually, we have limited resources. And so for all of those reasons, I'm trying to, as you can tell, I'm trying to inject a, a, a dose of reality to this debate here. It's really difficult. It's really difficult to make general, hugely intelligent things. But what we can do, 
and let's pan out one more stage. What we can do, at our best, we can have a curve like this. What we can do is we can identify specific problems. We can create algorithms that solve those problems. We can figure out which, which AI algorithms, which AI methods are best suited, and then we apply them properly. And we optimize each approach for each problem. And at best, it looked like this. This is also, at best, what a company looks like when it's got a good market, product market fit. At best, it's going to look like this. Often it doesn't. Often it falls off rather quickly. But at best, this is what we can hope for. And in AI research, at best, this is what we're going to get. For every new algorithm, we design it, we apply it, and it can solve that problem up to that level. Then a new problem comes along, we adapt the algorithm, we create a new algorithm, it'll solve it up to that level. I've probably spoken a long time. Um, let, let me just try and be optimistic again about this. The, what we're trying to do, we're, we're not solving these problems randomly. We're solving real problems in society. The reason why we're doing this, the reason why we're creating AI is actually to improve the life of people. We've never had more people alive on this planet. And the problem is survival. You've seen from Stephen all the nice positive directions. Well, a lot of this is helped in no small part by clever technology. And today, the clever technology is becoming smart software, AI. So people like me are solving these problems every day for real reasons. The reasons are we need to get power distributed to large populations. We need to get water distributed. We need to have good optimal food distribution. We want to improve our medicine. All of these different things we can do. We've got better data. We've got good techniques. So the optimistic part is, no, these aren't going to get out of control, but they're really good at solving these rather crucial problems. Now, some people will argue, I'm sure we're going to hear later, oh, no, we, we, we're going to have so much automation, we're going to lose all the jobs. Well, I have to say, I think it's a spurious argument that AI is going to be doing this. There's always been a push towards increased automation, increased efficiency. Now, I could say, look at that robot in that factory rolling around, it's replaced 10 people's jobs, 100 people's jobs. Look at the way it rolls around on those wheels. Wheels, eh? Oh, no. Wheels. Is, is it rational to be optimistic about wheels? Oh, dear. just think, think of the devastation the wheel has caused. Think of the, the, the millions of lives that have been lost because of the wheel. Now, do we want to get rid of the wheel? I don't think so. AI is smart software. It's just one component in all the different technologies that we're creating. It's not the only component. It's an important component. But you can't blame smart software for this. And the, to end on a positive note, the nice thing about computing is, the nice thing about what we can do today is we rapidly spread these ideas. We democratize through the internet all of these ideas. So it used to be 20 years ago that you had to be a domain expert to edit photos or to create a studio music track. Today anyone can do it because the software is readily available. Anyone can produce an amazing piece of music on their, on their laptop or they can edit photos professionally if they choose. Now already the same thing is happening with AI software. It used to be you had to be a complete domain expert to apply it and use it no longer. Just a few weeks ago, Apple released their machine learning framework for all the iOS devices. Any programmer can now uh, apply these techniques, and it's becoming easier and easier. Now, for sure, if you want to do really advanced stuff, I don't want to take my own business away, so if you want to do really advanced stuff, come to us and we'll help you. And if you want to invent new algorithms, you can do it in my lab. But for every day, machine learning stuff, AI technologies, it's already available. Another five years, 
this super fashionable job of data scientist will probably cease to exist because anybody will be able to do it. So actually, these technologies, just like the Internet did, they're going to create vast numbers of jobs. And right now, they already are. There are hundreds of AI companies at, at University College London. We cannot create data scientists, computer scientists fast enough to meet the demand. There are so many jobs out there. And every company needs a lot of support. And every new technology, self-driving cars, yeah, we might need entire new road systems. There will be an awful lot of infrastructure that has to be put in. That creates jobs. So actually, as far as I'm concerned, this is progress. This is another tool in the history of human society. It's another way that we help ourselves to survive. But it's not people that should be worrying about AI, it's people that should be worrying about people. People kill each other. AIs are not the problem. AI is actually being designed to save lives, to improve lives. I'll stop there. I, I remind everybody that we have um, 15 minutes each. Okay, because it is possible to be ready uh, before 12 and start the, the debate because uh, people are very willing to put the, the, the questions. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to hear Miles Brundage from the Future of Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford. Miles. So I feel a bit self-conscious about my remarks now, uh, given that optimism was described as sounding frivolous to most people, and all, there was a lot of cold water thrown on uh, various extreme claims about AI uh, in, in the last remarks. But I think that there are things to be said that aren't frivolous and that uh, do not depend on uh, human-level AI or super-intelligent AI being around the corner, but nevertheless put AI in a broader historical context and might lead one to think with some good reason uh, that AI could be a critical technology in humanity's future and indeed help some of the positive trends that Dr. Pinker spoke about earlier to continue. Um, can you go to the next slide, please. I, but I don't think that was me. Um, uh, so what I mean by conditional optimism about AI is that if we successfully address the technical and governance challenges uh, associated with uh, increasingly powerful AI, it's likely to be extremely beneficial in all sorts of ways that I'll enumerate shortly. Uh, and importantly, the same characteristics of AI that lend itself to some of the concerns that Dr. Bentley was uh, gesturing towards and Dr. Hogstrom will be talking about uh, later, I believe, uh, are also the reasons why AI could be extremely beneficial. And I'll go into some detail uh, about what those characteristics are. Next slide, please. So uh, it's somewhat misleading to talk about the nature of AI uh, and uh, a lot of the way that people talk about AI implicitly anthropomorphizes it. But in reality, AI is a synthetic creation and uh, it's important to remember uh, a, an idea that is emphasized by uh, my colleague Nick Bostrom, which is that more or less any level of intelligence is in principle compatible with more or less any set of goals, which is to say that AI, even if it were arbitrarily more intelligent, you know, within physical limits, as pointed out by Dr. Bentley, uh, relative to humans, that does not mean that it will be human-like in its thought processes or that it will uh, pursue the same sorts of survival instinct goals or mating uh, goals as humans. It could be, it could be uh, fulfilling the better angels of our nature or the worse angels of our nature, depending on how it's designed. Uh, if the goals of powerful AI systems are not sufficiently well aligned with human values, then we'll have extreme competence directed towards potentially dangerous ends. And likewise, malicious or self-interested actors could direct AI systems towards arbitrarily harmful ends. But what I want to discuss here is what if that doesn't happen? What if we figure out how to design AI systems that are aligned with human values and we keep them away in some fashion from malicious actors? 
uh, or we counterbalance those malicious AIs in some fashion, then what we'll have is a combination of high competence and high scalability. So by competence, I mean the ability of an AI system to replicate human performance in a particular domain or potentially across a wide range of domains, uh, either at the human level or at a superhuman level. So the example of AlphaGo is very timely given that uh, just yesterday, uh, DeepMind announced a second uh, paper in the, uh, the journal Nature uh, describing recent developments to uh, the AlphaGo system, which are, are significantly in excess of the performance which was previously achieved. And this is a common trend in AI, that while there are some cases in which uh, performance asymptotes below or around or just above the human level, in this case there was an extreme uh, exceeding of human performance. And re whether the performance is at the human level or the superhuman level, uh, what's important to recognize about AI is that we have the ability to combine this competence with scalability in a way that is not the case with other uh, forms of technology. So there are many technologies that can do one specific task, but they can't do multiple tasks, and they can't, we can't produce arbitrary numbers of units of those uh, technologies while having that flexibility. So in the same way that a human is both competent uh, and general in uh, the, way, the sorts of tasks that they can carry out, but on the other hand is not as scalable in, because it takes nine months to produce a human and many years to educate them, it is not the case that it takes that long to produce a copy of software. So to take an example of machine translation, once Google's neural machine translation system demonstrated a significant improvement over previous statistical uh, translation methods, it was quickly able to roll that out to a large number of languages and millions of customers being uh, used many tens of millions or more times per day. So this scalability applies both to the number of units of AI systems, uh, limited only by the number uh, and speed of computing hardware, as well as the throughput of the system. So translation, but ultimately more advanced cognitive capabilities such as personal assistance can be produced in this fashion. And this is a very significant development uh, in terms of AI social impacts. When we put these together, we have scalability combined with high performance and potentially arbitrary goals which means that we can have scalable competence uh, in a way that is equivalent in some sense to having a large army of humans directed towards arbitrary problems, but it is able to be mustered much faster and more ethically uh, analogous to slavery but without the ethical uh, quandaries, which I'll touch more about uh, later. So to, at least any problem that in principle could be solved by humans eventually given enough time uh, those, that domain of problems can be solved with artificial intelligence if we achieve the technological limits of AI. It might be the case that there are qualitative advantages to AI that far exceed human cognitive capabilities. But assuming that there's nothing magical going on in the human brain, that's at least a level that we can expect to achieve eventually. That is scalable human competence. However, we think that there are also, uh, you know, the AI research community also believes uh, that there are things that can, there are ways in which we can go beyond that. Uh, so AI systems in principle can be more transparent than humans, although the, it is not the case today that AI systems are always transparent. Often they rely on uh, opaque neural network approaches, uh, and it's not the case that, uh, that people can always audit these systems. In principle, AI allows us to have this scalable competence uh, while also having additional beneficial characteristics such as transparency and the ability to commit credibly to, uh, say, providing a public good in a corruption-free manner. Uh, so this means that we needn't necessarily worry about AI systems, say, defecting, which is a common problem in humans. This can allow us to have more uh, hot, more just public services because we can have the same competence but without the concern about self-interest and, uh, and survival instincts and so forth uh, dr driving us away from the performance that we would like. Uh, so to summarize what we can get if we combine these positive characteristics of AI, for, there are five things that I'll highlight in particular and then I'll go into more detail about three of, uh, about three of them. 
One is task expedition, by which I mean expediting the rate at which we can solve certain tasks. If we are able to combine scalability with competence, we can direct that towards solving a wide range of human problems. Secondly, we can improve the ability to coordinate at large scales and deal with various problems such as uh, arms control, where there are issues around defection and verification that AI can uh, help. Uh, next, there's corruption-free public services, which I just briefly mentioned, is a byproduct of combining performance with auditability. Uh, next, there's economic productivity. And finally, a byproduct of that is an ethical leisure society, which is only possible through the use of AI, at least at current standards of living. Otherwise, uh, only a subset of human society would be able to have a leisure society on the backs of uh, human slaves or human workers in some fashion. So these are the three that I'll highlight. Uh, next slide, please. So task expedition, briefly, is the idea that AI will enable us to rapidly, uh, compared to a world without AI, uh, solve various tasks that are physically possible in principle. So again, noting that there are limitations on the sorts of tasks that we can solve, and often solving one problem will uh, lead to a new problem to be solved. Uh, but tasks that require substantial labor and cognition in order to solve. Uh, these are the, some examples of these include the development and deployment of cheap renewable energy technologies, solving known health problems, and developing atomically precise manufacturing, aka uh, molecular nanotechnology. These are all things that are known to be possible in principle, uh, but would be much easier to achieve if we had scalable scientists that don't need to take time to develop a PhD, but instead can be copied and work in perfect coordination at a very high pace. Uh, the next area that I'll talk about is uh, improved coordination. There are many opportunities for Pareto improvements, that is to say improvements that benefit one party uh, without leaving any side worse off, such as in the domain of arms control, where it would be better if multiple parties were to, say, uh, destroy nuclear weapons. But there are some cases where we haven't been able to negotiate those additional reductions of uh, nuclear weapons uh, or other technologies because there's concern that the other side will defect or that it will be difficult to monitor compliance. And human mistrust, generally speaking, is a sticking point in a lot of negotiations and a lot of efforts at coordination. AI can help with this in two ways. First, privacy-preserving surveillance can be used to monitor for defection in various efforts at coordination. So, for example, no human needs to see the footage of some camera which is aimed at a uh, nuclear uh, weapons facility, but an AI system could be uh, designed in such a way that it flags noncompliance with the agreement uh, without necessarily leaking excessive information. Secondly, uh, AI systems could directly execute uh, certain agreements in a way that's agreed upon by both parties. This is, again, a benefit of the transparency, or at least the potential for transparency of AI systems, which is not the case with humans. Again, humans have a lot of uh, benefits uh, associated with them, but they are not always as transparent as software can in principle be. This means that we cannot always trust them to the extent that we would like to, and this uh, ma makes AI an important lever in future coordination. The final benefit that I'll talk about is the idea of an ethical leisure society. So as previously noted uh, in some of his nonfiction writing, Isaac Asimov uh, suggested that the only way to have an ethical leisure society is on the backs of robot slaves. I think that the idea of robot slaves is somewhat misleading in that they needn't be designed in such a way that they have to suffer or that they would be resenting their social status or even having any cognition or any consciousness at all that, necessar uh, that necessarily goes alongside their cognition. Indeed, AI systems are synthetic, and therefore they needn't have the same correlation of these various cognitive features which come bundled together in the case of humans. But it's important to note that as a result of economic productivity, not only could we have the same level of uh, productivity and, uh, and uh, quality of life that is currently accessible to uh, the rich population be more widely distributed, we could also have an ever-increasing share uh, of the uh, – an ever-increasing level of uh, 
uh, societal welfare distributed as a result of robot and AI productivity, uh, which can grow on itself exponentially. This is a case where, in fact, I think an exponential perspective is justified because there are uh, fairly, uh, fairly high limits on the amount of digital uh, technologies that we can develop. So uh, with silicon and uh, some uh, silicon being extremely abundant, there are some rare rare earth minerals uh, that we'll run into, uh, but I think we will, through the combination of uh, various innovations, ultimately be able to produce large amounts of robots and uh, produce a lot of economic productivity. Uh, next slide, please. So just to wrap up, uh, I suggested that we can be conditionally optimistic about AI. That's not to say that we will definitely achieve all of the, the great things that I just discussed, but rather that if we can navigate the very serious challenges, which Dr. Hogstrom will be talking more about, uh, then these are the sorts of things we can look forward to and that justify not just banning AI uh, to begin with. They are important to take into account in an overall set, in an overall landscape of not just the near-term applications of AI, but its long-term benefits and its long-term risks. So just to uh, be, make clear that I am not... Uh, uh, Pollyannish about uh, the benefits of AI, as, as uh, Dr. Pinker noted, uh, as is a risk with optimistic perspectives. Uh, there are several examples of very serious challenges uh, that are associated with the development of AI. So the same characteristics that make the great scenarios that I discussed previously, like combining competence and scalability, also open up a wide variety of opportunities for misuse. For, exa for example, automated hacking and spear phishing attacks, uh, lethal swarms of uh, drones that have human-level facial recognition systems. Uh, we should be concerned about competitive dynamics between countries and companies that are trying to develop the most powerful AI systems that they can, uh, including for the sorts of applications that I just mentioned. Uh, there are many technical challenges in, sh in ensuring uh, the safe alignment of AI systems with human values uh, and combining that high, high degree of performance with the high degrees of transparency that would be valuable, not to mention actually solving all the, the, the main problems in, a in getting AI to work. Uh, over the longer term, there are issues in avoiding a slide towards a stable authoritarian government if we try to make advan take advantage of the use of surveillance to solve these coordination problems and to carry out a more aggressive arms control. How do we ensure that that isn't misused? We need to avoid human enfeeblement as we move towards a leisure society, if we move towards a leisure society. And finally, we need to consider the equitable distribution of benefits of AI so that even if everyone benefits, it's not going overly disproportionately to those at the top. Uh, just to summarize uh, before I conclude, uh, the title of my talk was Scaling Up Humanity. And I think there are three senses in which AI could help scale up humanity. There's the sense in which AI could enable larger scale coordination uh, and allow us to solve bigger collective action problems than ever before. There's a sense in which AI allows us to apply more competence to very large problems, uh, in that sense scaling up the effort applied to very big problems. And finally, in, the, uh, in perhaps the most exciting vision for AI, it could allow us to more quickly solve some of the thorny problems associated with environmental sustainability and space exploration, ultimately allowing us to move more rapidly but also sustainably into the stars. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you. Oli Hagstrom. Our next speaker is Oli Hagstrom from Chalmers University of Technology. He, he wrote the book that I mentioned before, Here Be Dragons. Uh, Oli, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. I was initially a little bit puzzled uh, by the term rational optimism because I've always thought of both optimism and pessimism as biases, biasing us away from, from the uh, rational, realistic uh, middle ground. But I think one can make sense of, of, of the term, and, and, and we've heard some uh, good arguments. Uh, next slide. Um, so 
what is rational optimism? And let me first tell you what I think rational optimism is not. Uh, next. Uh, so it's not uh, to claim based on insufficient evidence that everything is going to be all right. That's, that's not the rational way pr to proceed. A better definition of rational optimism is to have an epistemically well-calibrated view of the future and its uncertainties, admit these uncertainties, to accept that the future is not written in stone, and then to act upon the working assumption that the chances for a good future may depend on what actions we take today. Now, that is not certain, but, but, but uh, uh, if, if it doesn't hold, then it doesn't matter what we do. So we may just as well assume as a working assumption that, that by doing good things today, we can affect the future in a good way. So there's a thin line to walk here, and I want to illustrate the difference with an example from one of Stephen's earlier books, which I think is a fantastic uh, tour de force ab about positive uh, development in, in our society over, over uh, years and centuries. Uh, the Better Angels of Our Nature from 2011, uh, where we learn how uh, violence uh, has declined. So there's, you, you saw in Stephen's talk uh, all these diagrams uh, of how things are getting better, and, and this is really, uh, you see the same thing in, in the previous book, uh, a very impressive amount of, of um, empirical evidence, and what Stephen does is that he summarizes, so this is about the de decline of violence, uh, that, that we, the readers of the book, uh, we live in a time and a place when people no longer have to worry about abduction into sexual slavery, divinely commanded genocide, and so on and so forth. All these bad, bad things having to do with, with violence, and, and there is statistics to back this up. But then comes at the very end, so uh, the um, uh, a, a trickier part, the prospect of a nuclear war that would put an end to civilization and to human life itself. In fact, we don't have the, uh, or it's not clear anyway that we have the evidence that, that there's no worry about this or, or that there wasn't in 2011. Maybe the war is bigger uh, today than, than six years ago, but never mind that. In order to state, can, can, um, uh, that present-day citizens live in a blessed state of safety from violence, we need in particular to establish that the risk of being killed in a global nuclear war is small. And that's a very difficult statistical problem. And, and if we compare it to a more mundane thing, such as the risk of, of dying from a lethal bicycle accident, that's an easy thing. Uh, I'm a statistician, so I know how to, how to estimate things from data. And, and we have tons and tons of data on lethal bi bicycle accidents, so I, can, I, I, I could give you a figure. Uh, but with global nuclear war, that's a much harder thing to do. Very, I mean, it has to do with how do you estimate the probability of something that never happened. Uh, yet this is something that we crucially need to understand to, st to state that, that uh, we live in this bliss state of, 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 of no risk. So uh, one has to start somewhere. So we, we, to, to, as a first uh, model attempt, we can assume not quite realistically stationary conditions, meaning that every year there's the same probability of outbreak of global nuclear war. So how many have we had? So this, this annual probability, we denoted lambda. We had no outbreak during the last 70 years. And this number zero turns into an estimate that, that the best estimate of, of lambda is zero. But then how sure can we be of that? And when you use statistical procedures to produce a 95% confidence interval for this uh, uh, parameter lambda, you get that lambda uh, with 95% confidence sits between zero and 0.06. And uh, that, that, that interval contains the value 0.05, for instance, corresponding to an expected time of 1 over 0.05, which is 20 years, until the next global nuclear war. And for the individual citizen, this means an annual death rate as a result of this of, of several percent. This is totally consistent with the data. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not saying that w there is no way in principle to rule this out, because uh, if, if we look at the next slide, uh, uh, 
I, I emphasize that we need to look, look much deeper into plausible causal mechanisms for nuclear war. We need to, to, to understand political science and electrical engineering to do this, and we need to do detailed analysis of incidents such as the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis and the 1983 Soviet nuclear false alarm incident. So I, I cannot give you a precise estimate of, of, of Lambda, but in, in my uh, latest book, Here Be Dragons, from 2016, I look at this risk and I look at various other risks uh, uh, that pose existential threats to humanity. And today we're here to speak about artificial intelligence, so I'll, I'll focus on that. Um, so uh, there's this thing with uh, uh, the, the most advanced emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, biotechnology, that they have this, they're double-edged. They come with enormous uh, economic and other benefits, and, and especially in Miles' presentation, we saw that uh, all these great things can potentially come about uh, as a result of artificial intelligence development. And basically, it's only in the limit, it's only the laws of physics that, that, that pose the limits. But these come together with enormous risks. There are risks uh, having to do with uh, autonomous weapons arms races. There are also risks having to do with uh, robosourcing and, and, and technological unemployment. And there's also this more exotic risk, uh, uh, namely the issue which I want to focus on here, on whether once we obtain an artificial intelligence breakthrough sufficient to create super intelligent artificial general intelligence, meaning something that outperforms the human brain uh, clearly ac across the whole range of, of capabilities. So that we know humans no longer are the most intelligent beings on the planet. Can we then expect to remain in control? So that's, that's a concern, and I want to give you this cartoonish kind of uh, example called Paperclip uh, Armageddon. Perhaps you've heard of it. Uh, what happens in this scenario is that a paperclip factory is run by an advanced but not yet super intelligent artificial intelligence program to find ways to maximize paperclip production. Then it happens that the engineers uh, um, uh, improving this machine happen to become uh, the, the successful, the, the first one to reach the critical threshold to enter uh, the rapid spiral of self-improvement that uh, uh, some theoreticians here uh, are, uh, have uh, discussed at least as a plausible uh, possibility, known as the singularity or an intelligence explosion. Uh, so then suddenly we have this super intelligent machine uh, uh, which has the goal of maximizing paperclip production. So it goes on to turn the entire solar system, including ourselves, into a giant heap of paperclips. We don't want this. So what's the point of this uh, paperclip Armageddon scenario? So one uh, point of choosing paperclips is to make it obvious that this is, this is a cartoonish example. It's not the paperclips that, that we're worried about, but more general scenarios. But, but, but the other point which is kind of important is to stress that for, some, for things to go really bad, you don't need to have any in, ill intentions. You don't need to have a mad scientist planning to destroy the world as a revenge of, against humanity. Even, even uh, um, mundane seeming uh, goals like paperclip production can go bad. So let's take a step back and, and, and look at this a little bit more generally and ask whether anything like that uh, might happen. And this question is, is most usefully uh, analyzed in two steps. The first step is to ask when, if ever, can we expect the super intelligent artificial intelligence to emerge? The second is, what can we then expect to happen? And on the first issue, well, first of all, people with a naturalistic worldview will probably all agree that, that uh, it, it's unlikely that evolution has found the global optimum of intelligence in, in the universe. There are uh, most likely configurations of matter that that vastly outperformed the human brain. And the question is, can we find these by the scientific method and how fast? And, and when you ask experts, well, if you ask Peter, he says it's not going to happen. If you ask some of his colleagues, they say that uh, it, it will or it might. And they're really divided. 
uh, as to whether a breakthrough of this kind can happen during the 21st century. So the possibility, because of this disagreement, should be taken seriously. So I'll skip the technical details on this and move on to the second issue of what will happen. So uh, we might, for precaution, there are suggestions that let's keep this AI boxed in so that uh, we can control it. But there are very good arguments that that strategy is, 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 uh, is not going to work in the long run with an entity that uh, uh, exceeds our intelligence. So it, we can uh, expect it to sooner or later escape the, uh, the box, and then our fate depends on what it is motivated to do because it can outsmart us in all sorts of ways. What will its, its goals be? The, answer, the short answer is we don't know, but there is uh, some theory about this, uh, the so-called Omohundra Bostrom theory of ultimate versus instrumental goals. Uh, Miles uh, emphasized uh, this uh, orthogonality thesis, which, sa which says that virtually any ultimate goal is compatible with arbitrarily high levels of intelligence. So the ultimate goal of this machine can be paperclip production, maximization of human happiness, or basically anything. Uh, However, there is also this other thesis, the instrumental convergence thesis, that says that there are a number of instrumental goals that we can expect the machine to set up as, as, as tools to achieve the ultimate goal, pretty much no matter what it's with this ultimate goal is. So that gives us a little bit of predicting power. So examples of these instrumental goals uh, are self-preservation, this machine is not going to want us to pull the plug on it because uh, then it's not going to be able to work uh, towards its goal. It, it will want to acquire hardware and other resources. It wants to improve its own software and hardware, which is kind of a crucial ingredient in the argument for, for, for the intelligence explosion. Uh, preservation of final goal. It will not want us to tamper with its goal because then it will not be able to uh, work for it in the future. And uh, finally, if the ultimate goal is disaligned with human values, it may be a good strategy for the machine to keep a low profile for a while until it knows how to take over. Okay. Um, so this, what do we do about this? There is this uh, uh, idea called friendly AI, is to somehow make sure that the first super intelligent AI has values that align well with ours so, so that it would do things that are that, that, that favor human welfare and so on and so forth. Now, because of the goal preservation instrumental goal, uh, there, there, there is an emphasis, uh, and, and, and this uh, goes back to work by uh, Yudkowsky and, uh, and uh, Nick Bostrom, uh, emphasizing the need to instill the AI with such values prior to the AI reaching superintelligence level because after that it's going to be too late. This seems to be a very difficult project where even small discrepancies can lead to a catastrophe. And someone, if you suggest the goal to the uh, uh, that we uh, uh, program the machine to maximize hedonic utility, maximize happiness minus su suffering in the world, that, that may sound very tempting, but uh, and, and it may create a very good world in some sense, but the problem for us is that a solution to this maximization is unlikely to involve the existence of humans. We are discussing here very uncharted uh, territories, so we need to be a little bit speculative, but we should also be humble about the, the, uh, our epistemic situation. Uh, we're so far from the familiar and the well-established. Uh, I think there's a fair chance that uh, we are making some fundamental mistakes somewhere in, in, in discussing these uh, orthogonality theses and paperclip Armageddon, in, uh, instrumental convergence, and so on. And it might be that this Yudkovsky Bostrom style AI risk is mere confusion. I don't quite see why, uh, and all, it w may well not be mere confusion. And I think that the, it's a, there's a fair chance that the risk is real. And therefore, I think that. Uh, Yudkovsky Bostrom style AI risk is worth taking seriously. And it's worth taking seriously now, not because uh, of the emergence of superintelligence uh, being imminent. It probably isn't. Uh, I'd be very surprised if, if it happens in the next few years. Uh, but the reason is that friendly AI is such a difficult project uh, that we may need uh, decades or more. Uh, 
to make it work. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, finish by, by, by showing you uh, uh, my book where I have a lot more on AI-related and other existential risks to humanity. Thank you. So can you hear me? No. Okay. How do you feel? <laughs> can you still take another 15 minutes? Uh, um, so this thing doesn't work. Somebody else? Huh? You do it? Okay. Which one? This one? Oh, good. <laughs> So maybe some of you in the room know these people. This is a famous, now famous um, EU project. It was the VERA project on virtual embodiment and robotic re-embodiment, where we try to transpose the sense of self into avatars. And this resulted in a code of conduct for ethics of virtual reality. Um, and I think we need something like this for AI too. I think we need something like a globalized code of uh, ethics and one that does not come out of the industry or a specific group of privileged individuals, but which eventually comes out of the political institutions. So just to take this as a starting example, I authored this with a young, uh, excellent American philosopher, Michael Madari, whom I hired for the project. And uh, this is open access. In this uh, code of conduct we developed in this European project for virtual reality, there are many details, but there are also some very general philosophical points. I'll just pull out one or two. Scientists must understand that following a code of ethics is not the same as being ethical. Um, I don't know if you understand that point, but um, we need a kind of ethical awareness, an active ethical attitude on the point of the researchers. And for virtual reality technology, there are a number of very general points that have a little bit to do with AI as well. Our best mathematical models of human brain dynamics now tell us that conscious experience is itself a form of virtual reality, which is biologically grounded. Um, more people, as this technology reaches the mass market right now, will understand this point. And this point, that what we've called conscious experience in the past is actually a biological form of VR, will have social cultural consequences. And virtual reality environments will create something like a socio-cognitive niche in which the human mind will adapt and evolve in the future. So these are examples for general conclusions from that report. And of course, they apply to the problem we're discussing here today as well. So last year I founded a German-speaking country a Foundation of Effective Altruism with a number of very brilliant quits. We have a headquarter in Berlin right now. And among other things we've done, we've published a policy paper on opportunities and risks for artificial intelligence. And what I want to do is not talk about any of the details in there with you, but I'll just pull out a few issues. You see there are, yeah, it actually works. So. There yeah, are a number of general points. I think we need institutional measures at this point. This has to be taken out of the hand of uh, the industry, uh, this debate, and the, out of the hand of media with their own interests. Um, and we need specific organizing efforts towards international um, research collaborations, for instance. But I won't go into these general points. Um, here are some of the, uh, uh, the general recommendations for the EU. So for instance, we have to think about an unconditional basic income and negative income tax in a new way. And uh, we have to also implement new forms of research grants to tackle these questions. And we have to find 
found new expert commissions and funding schemes, uh, incentive landscapes to pull good people into this debate. But um, let us look just at three very detailed points and then I'll finish. And this connects to what you just said. Um, the first example is, is that I think pessimism or optimism really is not the question. What we need is very fine-grained, evidence-based uh, risk management, rational and evidence-based, not mega questions like rationalism, uh, optimism and pessimism. And here's one example. It's a standard principle from uh, rational risk management that even if the probability of a very high future damage is actually low, it is rational to invest resources into investing risk minimization today. Even if the probability of the risk itself is low, um, we have to work today. Now, this is counterintuitive. It's a general principle of rationality, but it's counterintuitive to most of us. Just think of the talks you've just heard. A normal human common, common sense says, yeah, come on. This is all science fiction. It's a new media genre. People fight for publicity. In five years, all of this is, is going to be gone. That's, the, that's how a normal person reacts to all of this. But there are real issues there, namely extreme future risks. And so we, in a certain way, we have to counteract our own intuitions and tackle this in a strictly rational way. Mm. So here uh, is a second constraint, an example, pulled out of this policy paper for you. I called it how to satisfy the globality constraint. So I talked about this code of conduct, the ethics code for virtual reality. Now, if we want um, to um, create a code of conduct, an ethics code for these AI issues, it has to be a global one. Why? Um, because we risk of banning um, AI research from those countries in which uh, a rational debate is possible. That is, we may cause a race to the bottom. If, say, in the EU, we come to strict safety regulations, the cutting-edge research will, just like with tax evasion, it will just go to other areas in the world. And the development of the technology will take place in other areas of the world um, with much uh, lower um, standards of ethics assessment, risk management, and so forth. So one thing we have to prevent is that there is a risky relocation of research to countries with lower safety standards. <coughs> That's recommendation number six. But this is also an example uh, of um, something where I think one cannot be a rational optimist to pick up Steve's point. It's just not rational to expect that we would man that humankind would manage this to have a global set of rules, ethical rules for how to develop AI in a friendly and safe way with no holes and no areas on the planet where these rules don't work. So I think this race to the bottom problem is a serious and real risk and there's no rational reason for um, optimism there. Which already brings me to the last point. And that last point is something that really sounds like science fiction. And you may know that I'm a consciousness researcher and that I'm one of the people who founded the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness 22 years ago. I'm really in this field. And the first thing I have to say is I do not believe that we will have synthetic phenomenology, meaning artificial consciousness, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. I have a very strong uh, um, intuition that this is not going to happen. We don't have a theory of consciousness we could implement. But that risk of uh, increasing the overall amount of suffering in the universe is one extreme risk. So for a number of years I've been arguing for a moratorium on synthetic phenomenology, meaning that 
the direct creation of not artificial intelligence but artificial consciousness should not be a target of any serious uh, form of academic research or anything that is funded, for instance, by the EU. There are people in England and there are people in Japan who are explicitly aiming also at artificial sentience, at artificial consciousness. And for many reasons, I think um, we should not do this. I have also formulated um, criteria because AI researchers have always asked me, okay, we really see the point, Thomas, how can we build AI that is safe to stay unconscious, that never begins to suffer, that never has uh, subjective preferences that can be thwarted? In, there are papers of mine that try to isolate uh, the main necessary conditions for what we should not do if we don't want to create artificial suffering. But that's this last problem, and I'll end on this, shows that the difficulty in the ethics of um, artificial intelligence as opposed to other fields of applied ethics is that we have so very different predictive horizons. We have predictive horizons like 2030 where we can make rather safe predictions and discuss risks. <coughs> but we also have these issues like artificial consciousness which sound really crazy to any normal person, but there are people working on it and there are people who want to make their career with it. So um, <clears throat> I think recommendation eight and nine are it's important to have an understanding of which natural and artificial systems have the capacity for producing consciousness, in particular for experiencing suffering given the apparent level of uncertainty and disagreement within the field of machine consciousness, there's a pressing need to promote, fund, and coordinate relevant interdisciplinary research projects. That is, this EA funding has to be related to the existing consciousness research uh, community. And I think um, we should really have ethics commissions that prevent an unexpected creation of sentient artificial life we should avoid this at all costs. We should not trigger a second level conscious evolution without knowing what we do recklessly just because some scientists want to go down in history. And then we have the problem that we cannot just shut these systems off anymore because, of course, they have a consciously experienced preference for continuing their own existence. So just these three examples I wanted to leave you with, and again, the general point, I think this is not about pessimism and about optimism. It's about very rational, sane work, creating the necessary political institutions and uh, ethics committees, and just set the standards in the, um, in the spirit of enlightenment. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to use my prerogative as, I guess, in the, the session chair uh, to offer some of my own comments, including some of the uh, remarks that I edited out of the uh, talk that I presented earlier today. Uh, I, I think there are serious uh, threats to humanity that we have to worry about, and nuclear war is certainly one of them. But as I, I teased in the, the slide, I think that... Uh, Runaway or rogue or malicious artificial intelligence is, uh, is not one of them. Uh, not, not that the risk is zero, the risk of nothing is zero, but humanity has a finite bud budget of worry. If uh, people are convinced that the, there are so many existential threats that we're not going to survive another generation, something is going to do us in, then they'll say, well, let's just have fun now. And, uh, uh, there's nothing that we're, we're doomed, uh, humanity is screwed, so um, let's just enjoy life while we can. I think it's very important to put risks in, in, uh, in, in some perspective. Uh, so I, why do I think that the uh, thought of uh, a robot takeover or artificial in, malicious art, artificial intelligence is uh, one of the things that we uh, don't need to worry about? Well, one is there, there, are, there have been false alarms before, plausible sounding uh, technological Armageddons that in retrospect we see are uh, ridiculous. 
Um, I'm referring specifically to the Y2K bug. Do you remember that? That in the 1990s, the big existential concern was that when the year 2000 came, all of the computers that had been programmed to represent a year by its final two digits would get confused about what year it was uh, on January 1st, 2000. And in that moment, and I'm not exaggerating, uh, airplanes would fall out of the sky, uh, nuclear power plants would melt down, incubators would shut off in um, neonatal wards, uh, nuclear missiles would be launched from their silos. Now, now we, and, and these were serious people that warned of this threat, uh, including President Clinton. Uh, in retrospect, we see that this was just letting fantasies go wild. So it is a, a danger that not every technological uh, Armageddon is, uh, turns out to be um, uh, uh, worth worrying about. Uh, there is a, uh, a tendency for uh, the pessimistic fantasies to get more attention than, than they deserve. And I actually think this is true of, of artificial intelligence uh, uh, running amok. Uh, first of all, as Peter said, and I agree 100% with his talks, artificial intelligence is really hard. Uh, Moore's law of the number of transistors you can fit onto a chip does not apply to, uh, to insight, to theorizing, to uh, actual artificial intelligence. Uh, to just take a, a contrast, I mean, there's talk about how a superintelligence will help us solve the, the uh, global warming problem. Well, do we have a, a uh, when will we see a robot that can do something that um, uh, certainly half of humanity would welcome, namely the ability to change a baby's diaper. Uh, uh, when will we see a robot that can do that? When will you hand over your baby to a robot? Um, the answer is not anytime soon. I mean, that, that itself would be a problem that is just an order of magnitude beyond uh, current state of, uh, of robotics. Uh, and, and I think that that's true for a lot of the hypothetical scenarios taken to the next level that uh, we really should not uh, expect the concept sometimes called foom after the comic book sound effect where hypothetically uh, artificial intelligence will improve itself recursively. I think that is probably uh, incoherent, let alone uh, not around the corner. It's like we're thinking about the development of a uh, machine that can do anything. What would that even mean, do anything? Uh, and likewise, a, an intelligence that can solve any problem, I suspect, is not a coherent concept because problems are so heterogeneous. They depend on so much detailed real-world knowledge that can only be applied by uh, experimentation in real time that the uh, brain smarter than ours that can solve all problems is, uh, is an incoherent concept. Second uh, uh, reason is that the... Uh, as has been mentioned, intelligence is compatible with any goal. These are uh, wanting something and knowing something, or um, desires and beliefs, motives and intelligence are two different concepts. We could program a, uh, uh, a computer to solve uh, ar arbitrary problems, but the problems are things that we have to decide upon in uh, designing the system to begin with. I th I think there is a tendency in, in uh, some of these scenarios to think that intelligence inevitably comes bundled with the desire to dominate, and so as our machines get smarter, it's only a matter of time before they'll want to enslave us. Um, look at what we humans have done to the uh, animal kingdom. Look at what uh, powerful civilizations have done to uh, more less technologically advanced civilizations. I think that's a confusion of the particular kind of intelligence that we happen to see in Homo sapiens, which was the uh, end product of natural selection, a naturally competitive process. So in the human brain, we have bundled together some degree of intelligence and some degree of uh, competitiveness, dominance, aggression. But the, that's just an accident of the evolutionary process that uh, built some of us, and there's uh, no reason whatsoever to think that it's in the very nature of intelligence that it should want to dominate. In fact, we know of one form of highly advanced intelligence that do does not come packaged with a ruthless desire to subjugate and dominate. They're called women. Um, <laughs> third, in the, uh, a more realistic scenario is not that there would be a kind of 
uh, HAL in 2001 that desires to dominate, but what has been referred to as the value alignment problem. Maybe if we gave the, a, an artificial intelligence the goal of making paper clips, it would turn our bodies into paper clips. If we gave it a goal of self-preservation, it would do uh, anything including destroy us to preserve itself. If we gave it the goal to maximize human happiness, it would rewire our brains so that we'd have a constant drip of, uh, of dopamine. Uh, I mean, the, uh, it seems to me that that kind of scenario is, is uh, self-refuting. I mean, the, the way to avoid that is don't build such a stupid system. Uh, that is, don't build a system that only has the goal, preserve yourself at all costs. We don't design any system that has one goal that, that, uh, that it pursues regardless of human cost. When we design a Cuisinart, there is the danger that, yes, you can chop your fingers off together with the carrots, and that's why we build uh, uh, finger guards. When we build a car, there's a danger that if it goes too fast, it'll crash. Well, yeah, and we put in brakes and a steering wheel. It's in the nature of technology that it serves uh, human interests. Of course it's possible to uh, stupidly design something that will pursue one goal at the expense of everything else that we value, and the solution is don't build a system like that. It's, a, a, it's self-contradictory to say that, that uh, uh, an intelligent system might pursue a goal uh, heedless of its side effects. That's not intelligence. That's not a system that we would ever build. And if you look at the uh, curves that I showed for the natural evolution of technologies, they all get safer and, uh, over time. That's because we learn from mistakes. We don't uh, let planes carry passengers until they've uh, proven that they're safe, often with many years and billions of dollars of testing. And that's clearly what we will do with artificial intelligence. We're not going to build a machine that, ha that is plugged into the world's uh, infrastructure that has just the goal, preserve yourself. That would be an idiotic thing to, 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 for, for, to build. Uh, what about malicious humans, the evil genius who actually does design a computer to um, to kind of weaponize artificial intelligence. Well, there's, a, I think, a, a, a fallacy of thinking that's that, uh, 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 as follows, and I've heard this argument a number of times. The natural progression of technology is to allow um, more and more to be done by um, uh, fewer and fewer people so that a, uh, eventually one person will have the tools to do anything, and given human nature, that means destroy everything. But there's actually another narrative that Kevin Kelly, the uh, founder of Wired magazine, points out that any technology at the cutting edge requires a network of people. There's no such thing as the evil genius. Uh, Google doesn't just find the highest IQ person they can find and, and uh, have him uh, solve problems all by himself. There's always a, a network within a company with connections to other companies, with connections to the government. And the more people you have in a network, the less likely it is to pursue some uh, fundamentally antisocial goal because people know other people who know other people. Uh, it's hard to have a conspiracy that works without leaks, without defection, without stings, without blunders. And as a society, as a technology advances, it becomes more socially distributed, which naturally puts limitations on the uh, single evil genius doing something that the vast uh, majority of, of uh, society doesn't want, such as swarms of bots that will uh, attack an individual based on facial recognition. There are an awful lot of people that don't want that to happen, more people who don't want it to happen than uh, who, conceivable, who could possi possibly do. Uh, and uh, therefore, that's why the mad scientist uh, does get um, confined to, to uh, science fiction. Uh, in, um, well, I think I've probably said enough, but that, that is one of the reasons why, uh, although I uh, don't believe that we should uh, rest easy about technology, um, we've got to prioritize our risks, and malicious AI, I think, is, is pretty low, low on the list, in my, in my opinion. And anyway, I've been told to, to wrap up, and let's uh, open it up to um, audience Q&A, or... Um, do other panelists want to comment first? Podemos tener un pequeño debate. We can create a little debate here and then begin with the 
audience's questions. We can start by debating amongst ourselves and then bring in questions from the public. So 10 minutes and then bring the audience in, because I'm sure there are a lot of questions that they want to ask. Mm. I'm usually first to the microphone. So uh, can, I, can I jump in and say, um, okay, clearly Stephen and I are agreeing on these issues. I, 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 tried, to, I tried to sort of head off the, the existential threat of AIs taking over us in my talk. Clearly didn't work. Um, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll have one, one more go, and that is, um, well, let, let me put it a different way. I think it's very, very foolish to treat AI as though it's one thing, because it's not. AI is smart software, and like all clever software, it's a series of different solutions to different problems, and each solution is designed specifically to solve that particular problem. It may be very good at it. Um, yeah, it may even be better than humans at certain things. Certainly my computer is a lot better at recognizing faces than I am. I'm terrible at recognizing faces. However, that's all it does. And so if you want to think of AI as any kind of thing that needs regulation, and in some cases, of course, it will, then just think of it in terms of any other technology. When we put in ABS systems in cars, we have to introduce new regulation, new certification, and new testing, make sure it works safely. So if we're going to put in AIs for self-driving vehicles, fine, it's a very specific application. They're not going to start forming communities of evil cars that want to take over the world. They're just going to drive us about. But it's a safety-critical application, so we have to certify and regulate and test them. So we've always done this, whether it's autopilots in aircraft, whatever it is, if it's safety-critical, we consider that specific application, we introduce the right regulation, the right certification, the right testing, and then we make it safe. As Stephen says, we're pretty good at this. So I suggest that we continue doing exactly this. The danger is actually if you, if you start classing a, a thousand different technologies, because that's what AI is, it's a thousand different ways of writing smart <laughs> solutions to different problems. If you say they're all the same thing, and you start regulating against this, then I'm afraid you really will harm progress. You really will prevent us from solving these critical problems, and we're only trying to keep people alive here. We're only trying to help people. Um, and as we've heard from other panel members, it's highly unlikely this kind of regulation would be made law across the planet, in which case all that would happen is China would become kings or Russia would become kings at this technology. So frankly, I don't see the problem here. We're all smart people. We know how to deal with safety critical systems. Why don't we just keep doing what we've always done and think about each problem as it arises and make sure we do the right thing. So uh, there have been a lot of things said by uh, Drs. Pinker and Bentley. I'll just pick up on the, the you know, I don't think we have time to get into the malicious uh, genius excuse issue. Me, excuse me, just a yeah. minute, because uh, it's not uh, uh, 12 and 30, we must uh, go okay. out. <laughs> All right, Thank you. I'll be yes. very brief. Yes. Uh, so I think just to, uh, you know, pick up on the point about the Cuisinart and, and safety critical technologies. I think uh, I generally agree with that way of characterizing the situation, but I'm less uh, optimistic about where we stand today in terms of the degree of investment and the degree of seriousness with which we're taking AI. So I, I do think it should be treated as any other technology in the sense that we should invest in safety and testing. The, and people are arguing that. So there was a Wall Street Journal uh, op-ed just yesterday by two uh, AI researchers at the company OpenAI uh, arguing that there could be extreme uh, safety risks from AI and there needs to be more safety research. 
the problem as I see it today is not that, you know, some are claiming that we should ban AI and, and others disagree and that we're risking setting back progress. It's that we don't know how to put the, the safety blockers on the Cuisinart of where the AI is the Cuisinart. It's just a conceptually very hard problem, and some are arguing that we should put a lot of effort into figuring out how to solve that problem. I, I've got to say, I just don't think that's true. Uh, it, 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 that only becomes true if you, if you think AI is one big thing. And it's not. If, if, you, if you just look at what we actually do, um, we, we apply specific AI solutions to specific problems, and if they are safety critical, then we introduce safety regulations accordingly. That's all. It's really not difficult, folks. It's not difficult. May I comment? Uh, um, so, uh, Stephen, you brought up this Y2K example, uh, and nothing terrible happened. Uh, but we actually made uh, a lot of preparation for this. And it, it may be that uh, things could have gone, uh, maybe not an apocalypse, but, but uh, probably no. not that. But, it but turns but out that countries much. and companies that didn't do Y2K readiness had no problems either. Uh, I actually looked into that. You have? Yeah, yeah, so it's Okay, uh, okay, so, so, so if, if that's right, then the Y2K was not a problem. It doesn't follow that uh, the emergence of superintelligence is not going to be a problem. So just saying that, let's not worry about it. That's the kind of irrational optimism. But it's, that but I it's not going to emerge. That's the point. It's, no. it's entirely irrational to even conceive that it will emerge because no. it, it's, uh, frankly, it, the most irrational belief right now is to believe there's going to be a superintelligence. It's like saying, okay, my pet dog, which has a remarkable brain, and it has the ability to adapt its brain. It has ability to construct its own brain, construct new versions of itself, change over time, maintain itself, repair itself. Why isn't, it, why isn't that taking over the world and becoming a superintelligent? It's far better than any technology we could hope to create for hundreds and probably thousands of years. Why is my pet dog not, not an existential threat? Well, okay. Uh, while we're finishing the debate here, I'd like to take down notes of the people who, in the audience who would like to contribute. I'll be very brief because I really, really want to sacrifice my time uh, so the audience can ask some questions. I just a question to you. Do you realize that there are already players in the field who have an interest that certain discussions do not take place? Do you see that? There's a high historical dynamics here already, right? Uh, the in, have you noticed that IBM doesn't speak about artificial intelligence anymore, but about cognitive computing, because they're afraid of these public ethical debates? I think this has to be pulled into the political institutions and done there. Uh, else there are too many players who pursue their own interests. But I'll be interested to hear what you think. Any questions? Who would like to put a question? We need a microphone for the speaker. So thank you very much for uh, the invitation. My name is Stella Veliki. I, I have studied physics uh, and informatics. Excuse, excuse me. One, one minute maximum, yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one, uh, two questions. One for, um, I don't know who can answer. Do you have some experiences with uh, artificial intelligence and quantum informatic technology? Um, and the second one is, uh, do you use the, Info, uh, artificial intelligence tools to discover or to, de to, to, have, to have the information for the next radicalization person, uh, I mean for the terrorist, and to have an alert and to say, look, for this person, I have a more than 40% probability that became a terrorist, and to give me the direction where shall I uh, uh, act. Okay, we're going to take a block of five questions and a go. Otherwise, we're just not going to have time. 
I think that we've got another uh, lady there. I also wanted to put a question just right behind the lady who just spoke, and then we'll move to her right. But we've got to be brief. We don't have that much time. Thank you very much for all and for your excellent uh, presentations. My, my question is, um, um, you, you all showed more or less uh, several graphs and, and ideas how the, the level of happiness at large in the world is, is, is increasing. Therefore, I would like to be, I would be interested in, in your views about how it's then explained all these movements in uh, expressed uh, radical movements that come up quite violently in several places in the world, and if there is any hope for artificial intelligence to help and avoid them. Me parece, sí, por favor. Yes, please, go ahead. Thank you for your explanation. Uh, my question is, uh, I would like to address Mr. Pinker and Mr. Bentley. You spoke about uh, not classifying uh, all kinds of artificial intelligence into one category and about um, submitting artificial intelligence to regulation and testing before releasing it onto the market and into the public. However, I would like to uh, refer to another novelty of, uh, that arose at the turn of the millennium, namely the Internet and the problems that the Internet still poses today, like the darknet, hacking, and uh, crimes, etc. And it is still not regulated, it is still not contained. Uh, shouldn't it be, uh, isn't it reasonable to provide a safety net to avoid further problems like the ones we face now with artificial intelligence? Thank you. Uh, brown shirt there to, to the right again. And just, again, we'll get uh, five questions and then we'll have some replies. Go ahead. Would you agree that mistaking machines for humans is a legal and ethical trap and that more specifically, you cannot molest or rape a sex doll because it is a machine, not a person? We have one more question. Please go ahead. Thank you. Very simple question to Professor Pinker, please. Um, should the interpreters and translators have fear of the future when it comes to AI and language technology? Uh, with a nod to the colleagues in the room, the interpreters, thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. You, you can... Uh, um, okay, so uh, of those I can recall, um, Quantum computing and um, AI, yes, there's some work going on in that area. It's very speculative because we don't really have proper quantum computers yet. There is some interesting work that, that uh, may improve some capabilities of some algorithms. Um, I've forgotten this, the other part of her question. Um, radicalization. Radicalization. Oh, well, and this kind of relates to some of the other people's questions too. There's... there's um, there's a danger that none of the panelists who like to, uh, the AI bashers, uh, perhaps are aware of, but I think it's actually a much more interesting danger. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of us now are relying on curated news on devices such as these. So a lot of us around the world are now reading our information, getting our information about the world through their, their little AIs. They're, they're trying to figure out what we like, and then based on what we like to read, they give us more of the same. Now, I happen to know many of the researchers that created these algorithms, and they even realized that there's a side effect of this. And the side effect is a polarization of opinion. It means that um, if you keep presenting the same thing that they like all the time, they don't get a general view of the world anymore. So this is actually a real danger of AI. It's a very specific application of AI, and it points to, as some of them are claiming, I don't know if this is true, but some are claiming this could explain some of the more radical behavior, some of the more unusual election results recently, because populations are becoming more polarized. They're no longer getting the general information that they once did. And this, then, how can we use AI to solve these issues? Well, we can actually change what we're asking it to do. At the moment, we're asking it to show us things that we like. Perhaps we should add a little bit of 
understanding of how to educate people as well. So show us a bit of what we like and show a bit of what we need. So that might be a useful thing to think about in terms of uh, helping democracies. Um, it, it's also, yes, it's definitely possible to use data mining, machine learning to track uh, potential terrorists. Uh, this is definitely something uh, we can please, do. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, tr I'll try to um, answer the uh, questions that are directed at my way. Uh, an excellent question of why, if the state of the world is improving, do you have these angry political movements that act as if the world is in deepening crisis, uh, Donald Trump being the prime example? One reason is that there is an enormous perception gap about happiness. Polls show that everyone thinks that everyone else is less happy than they really are by 40 percentage points. And much of the anger in political movements does not come from personal unhappiness. It comes from narratives or theories of the world in which you think that other people are being uh, exploited or made miserable, even though you're doing okay. So it really depends on con uh, as much on guiding the, the narrative, the arguments, the polemics, as in improving people's uh, actual standard of living. Can artificial intelligence help with that? Um, I doubt it. Uh, other question, will uh, artificial intelligence replace interpreters? I, I suspect not uh, anytime soon for some of the reasons that, that uh, Peter pointed out. Namely, uh, problems in artificial intelligence are really, really hard. And we can get, uh, often there's like a sudden leap to a certain level of competence, but then um, scaling that up to the competence that we would need, particularly in the domain of uh, interpretation, where there are very subtle uh, 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 arguments being made in a forum like this, uh, just knowing the general gist or the topic of the conversation, which our translators, translation systems can already do, is just not going to be good enough. And if you use Google Translate, you probably have the same experience that I do. You get a general sense of what it's about, but if it's anything related to your own strong interests, 70% uh, is just not good enough. It has to be you know, uh, way up in the 90s. Uh, the final point is, their new technologies, like the Internet, uh, always are going to come with unanticipated consequences. Solutions to problems all, always create new problems that have to be uh, solved in their, in their turn, many of which cannot be anticipated when the technology is on the, the drawing board. But the tendency, such as when cars were introduced, the rate of death was, was, asked, was sky high. I mean, new cars really were a menace. But the danger was brought down as engineers started to um, inspect the, the wreckage, compile the statistics. Uh, people generally want things to be safe. Uh, and uh, something that uh, has only appeared in the last five or ten years, there are definitely going to be problems. It doesn't mean that it's a portent of the future because we're just starting to mount a, uh, a defense against it. As for a kind of race for the bottom where uh, safety, the argument that safety features are futile because uh, other countries will simply circumvent them, I think that too is not the general direction that technology has taken. We aren't seeing uh, huge numbers of, of uh, planes that crash being manufactured by uh, China to undercut us because no one wants planes to crash. And uh, the deleterious effects of new technology are generally things that people all over have an interest in trying to mitigate. Let's take five more questions. Yes, red tie. Very short question. I am a consultant in Brussels. Um, question for Steven Pinker. You said that we need to change the narratives, close the perception gap. Why don't you think algorithms can help with that? Excuse me. Arkady? Arkady, go ahead. Una pregunta para el... A question for Dr. Pinker. I'd like to thank him for being here and for his presentation. I think you explain in your book there's a link between general pessimism and bad news that are provided to us. But we should recognize that that's the same bad news we're interested in when we're walking along the street and we see somebody uh, fall and we look at them. But my specific question would be, when you're talking about the bad news in newspapers, 
as a characteristic of existence. That's not a factor of optimism. That ontological pessimism in newspapers hasn't contributed to progress. And has, has it contributed to progress and the improvement of the human condition? And then uh, on the polarisation of news that was mentioned, it's not that internet has brought polarisation of news that already existed beforehand. We all had our choice of newspaper uh, broadcasts and so on. But we thought that the internet would end that polarisation. It was one of many um, utopias that hasn't uh, been fulfilled. Polarisation has continued, perhaps because we're seeing an increase in the amount of news consumed. Oui. Thank you. Um, my main question is the transparency of IA process, uh, as uh, talked about by uh, Miles Brandage for uh, Professor Bentley. And uh, in link with uh, quantum computing, since uh, most quantum computing now is uh, energy minimization problems and uh, are uh, worked with in black box, so we really can't know what we do and what uh, about the transparency of the IA process that use a quantum computer and then about the legal st status uh, that was talked about uh, Thomas, uh, by Thomas Metzinger and uh, we, are, we are ethically bound to not kill IA that could be sentient uh, if they are someday but uh, legally they, are, they have no standing so anybody could uh, just shut down the computer and uh, there would be no sanctions. So maybe we should do something. We should uh, create a status for those IA. Microphone for the chair, please. Microphone for the chair. Thank you. Uh, si, 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 uh, uh, I will have a very short question. Uh, um, I would uh, uh, want to ask, uh, is this proposal which was just made about a global, a global universal charter, not a, a relatively good solution, even if there might be difficulties to monitor its implementations in the whole world? And do people like uh, uh, Bill Gates from the private sector and Stephen Hawking, who is from the fundamental physics, are they not informed enough about uh, artificial intelligence? Thank you. The, uh, pertaining to the question of why, why don't I think there can be algorithms that will uh, help us recraft narratives to uh, uh, minimize uh, possibly dangerous political movements like authoritarian populism. Well, for one thing, it's, a, it's an ill-posed problem. We don't know exactly what we're, the problem, that we're, how to specify what would count as a solution or what we're aiming at. And even if we did, you know, as, as Peter pointed out, problems in artificial intelligence are really, really hard. Uh, you can't just say, well, let's get an algorithm to do it. It's like saying, well, to help change, a, 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 to relieve mothers of having to change diapers, let's get a machine to do it. Well, you can say that, but actually building the machine is really, really hard. And there isn't a team of hundreds of brilliant AI researchers being funded by companies that are thinking about how to change political messaging. You may as well get a team of 100 uh, people just thinking about how to change political messaging themselves using the natural intelligence, would, that would probably be a more direct way of uh, solving the problem. In terms of uh, pessimism and, and uh, bad news, there is a, uh, you know, a, a ethic in journalism that to be serious, you have to point out what's going wrong. If you point out what's going right, that's advertising. That's not journalism. And, the, uh, and indeed, there has been a benefit to pointing out corruption and injustice and uh, uh, hidden problems. There, uh, certainly journalism must continue to do that. But any feedback signal that only indicates when things are going wrong and never indicates when anything is going right can only lead to a kind of cynicism that nothing that we do can make anything go right. It's, even if it's just a question of accurately holding authorities to account, you've got to, sh to be able to show, well, in some parts of the world, some things are working. So that is a benchmark that people in power uh, ought to uh, aspire to. 
So let me just very briefly underline your point. It is, of course, true that the conscious artificial subjects of the future have no representative in any ethics committee or in any political process today. That's just right. It's an abstract point that is right. But, of course, it points to a larger issue. Conscious human beings of the future are also only weakly represented in their preferences in the political process right now. And much more strongly, the conscious animal, the, the trillions of conscious animals that are living on this planet now and in the future, their interests are also almost not represented in ethics committees and in the political um, process. So um, I very much like, as a German philosopher, of course, likes it uh, if an American psychologist suddenly promotes the uh, ideals of enlightenment. But that component of humanism in the ideal of enlightenment is actually a weak and insufficient component. True enlightenment would take the suffering of all creatures that are, uh, have the capacity for suffering into account, not only human beings. That includes animals today, and that was your point, possibly conscious machines of the future. Uh, just uh, two quick points. One is on the transparency question related to uh, quantum AI. So uh, I haven't heard of anything related to transparency for quantum AI, and I think that's just because there isn't that much going on yet in uh, uh, quantum AI. And I, I, sus I think as in other cases of transparency in AI, there will be sort of a catch-up process as uh, as systems get deployed more widely, people start to ask hard questions about how interpretable and auditable they are. Um, I, ideally, we'd be more proactive about it, but so far that's been the case. Uh, the, uh, the other question I want to briefly uh, pick up on is the Bill Gates and Stephen Hawking, like do they not know enough about uh, AI? Uh, I think to some extent that's, uh, you know, the, the wrong question. To me, the... The more interesting question is why do experts disagree so much? So uh, there, there are very interesting surveys uh, of expert opinion on these precisely these questions of uh, what do you b believe about this argument that uh, a misaligned AI could, uh, you know, could uh, cause all these problems and how soon do you think we'll have human level AI and all these sorts of questions. And there's a huge range of expert opinion. and. More interestingly, experts are unaware of how much other experts disagree with them. So there's a lot of variation and not a good account of that uh, disagreement. So that, that to me is, is noteworthy when anyone says that, oh, well, AI experts all disagree with Stephen Hawking. Actually, you can find AI experts to disagree with every other AI can expert. I, can, I, can, I just, can I just speak to that? So I, I, I was very interested in that poll. I think it was Nick Bostrom who conducted it. And in, in, uh, when the 100 most cited AI researchers were, were uh, polled as to whether AI represents some uh, existential threat, 92% uh, said no, 8% said yes. So there is disagreement. Uh, how you interpret the 8%, uh, well, we don't know how to interpret the 8%. There's a different, more authoritative, sorry. There's a different, more authoritative survey that I'm referring to, but uh, we don't know, probably can't go well, super into detail. I, I, all I can say is um, all of my colleagues, and I go, I, you know, I, I've been around the field a long time. I work in this area. I've got more than 20 PhD students who've completed. They run labs all around the world. I know guys in DeepMind. I know guys in Facebook, in Google, um, Yahoo. Uh, the list goes on and on. I do not know anyone who works in this field who's a computer scientist who believes there's going to be some kind of superintelligence. I just don't know anyone. And, okay, that's, uh, that's not a survey, no, but it's certainly a, a bunch of very good, clever people who've worked in the area for decades. Um, so many of them pioneers, including people like Jeff Hinton. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's um, – sorry, guys, I think it's nonsense. Happy to make introductions. There's also an excellent volume uh, actually available online for those of you who want to pursue it further called What Do You Think of Machines That Think? 
on edge.org. It's also a paperback book, and it's a, a survey of, uh, I wouldn't say all, but a lot of the uh, leading thinkers in artificial intelligence and philosophy of artificial intelligence, and I highly recommend that collection. So John Brockman is the editor, edge.org. What do you think of machines that think? Well, we have uh, two minutes left. If anybody uh, at the top table would like to add anything. We have two minutes if you want to say something. Yes. Um, we've heard a lot of disagreement. There was one point on one of my slides that you may have overlooked. It's called epistemic modesty. And I think this may be a, a good closing word. All of us really don't know what the answer to many of these questions is. And I think epistemic modesty is something that really should guide future debates in this. Um, there are many unknown unknowns still. Okay, let's wind up. We've gone a little bit beyond the, our time limit. An extremely interesting debate. Fantastic speakers have opened our eyes to many issues, and we've had a wonderful chair, a wonderful moderator. I'd like to thank him a great deal for having been here with us this morning. Thank you very much to all of you for coming. And I hope you will follow our Euromind events, our upcoming events. We're going to have many interesting events in the future. Thank you very much for coming and see you soon, I hope.